Great. So with that, I would like to, you know, welcome everybody for, for this research seminar uh, for contract 20RD005, uh, which is titled A Data Science Framework to Measure uh, Vehicles Miles Travel <clears throat> by Mode and Purpose. Uh, my name is Jose Lopez, and I am uh, the Air Pollution Specialist in the Research Division uh, and also the Contract Manager for this study. And I will also be helping facilitate some portions of the seminar today. Also, just another quick icebreaker here before um, we move on, just to kind of get a feel of who is joining us today. I would like to, you know, ask you to type in the chat where are you joining from today, and if you are representing any particular uh, organization. So uh, uh, we'll make a quick pause here as well, uh, just to acknowledge also some of the people that are joining us uh, from different places throughout the state or maybe outside of the state. So again, icebreaker question, where are you joining from today and if you're representing any organization? Oh, I see someone from New York, Rochester, New York. Great. See some folks from, from the Bay Area. Okay. Chicago, wow, great. We're going national, that's great. Newberry Springs, California. Thank you. Bay Area, Sacramento, Caltrans. All right, well, thank you. Keep them coming. Uh, so we, we all know where folks are coming from. I'll just keep going uh, to move forward with their agenda here. So uh, we have uh, some, um, this is basically the agenda for today and I'll just be sharing some housekeeping items. So as you know, the meeting is being recorded. Uh, and the recording will be made available in CARF's YouTube channel in about one week from today. Uh, also, if you would like to speak or make a comment, I encourage you to use a Henry's feature or type in your comment in the chat. Uh, also note that the chat will be saved as well. Uh, and also this contract has a web page where you can access the final report, today's presentation, and the link to the recording. Uh, this uh, will be posted as soon as they become available. I just wanted to note that the today's presentation is already posted in the in the web page. So and you can also contact me for a copy of any of these items. Uh, and shortly I will just be dropping the links to both the contract web page and the YouTube channel in the chat along with my email. Uh, so you can have that information available. After that, I'll in the next slide I will just provide a, uh, and share a contract overview. Then I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Marta Gonzalez to begin uh, the presentation. And after her presentation, we will have time for a question and answer period where I encourage you to voice your questions or comments or verbally uh, use the chat, you know, uh, to uh, use a hand raise feature if you wish to speak. And this will help us keep track of all the speakers uh, we have today. Uh, and after that, we'll just wrap it up and begin the, the seminar. Close the seminar. Okay, so this is just an overview, just a little bit about the motivation after this study. So uh, this contract is to support the goals of Senate Bill 375. And SB 375 requires the metropolitan planning organizations uh, to create sustainable, uh, sustainable community strategies that integrate transportation, land use, and housing policies to plan for how vehicles might travel and the associated greenhouse gas emissions will be, re will be reduced to meet uh, climate, uh, California climate goals. And specifically, the goal for this contract was to develop techniques to integrate and analyze existing data, including cell phone data, to create a statewide picture of vehicle miles travel changes over time and extract behavioral choices to generate estimates uh, of urban mobility before, during, and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we also have our principal investigator for this study, Dr. Marta Gonzalez. Uh, she's an associate professor of city and regional planning, civil and environmental engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. And a, physics, uh, and a physics research faculty in the energy technology area at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab National Laboratory. Her research uh, focuses on urban sciences with a focus on the build, on the intersections of people with a built and the natural environment and their social networks. And she has also developed new tools that impact transportation research and discover novel approaches to model human mobility and the adoption of energy technologies. And now with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Marta Gonzalez to begin the presentation 
and tell us more about these projects and the findings. Thank you, Jose. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, Jose, do you recommend that I take uh, questions as I speak, or we should uh, leave the questions for the end? What is the usual practice you do? Usually, I think at the at the end, unless there is any clarifying questions, then folks can, can, can do that. Okay. Yes, it, it was a several task project. It's long. So I, in theory, I have one minute, one hour to present or one hour, 50 minutes to present and then 30 minutes for discussion. Is that the agenda or, or what do you suggest? Yes. Yeah, we have until 4.30, like about an hour, 20 minutes. Yeah. So. Exactly. That's what I thought then. But please, in order to make it a me talking for the next 50 minutes, I would really love some interruptions if you if you would like to um to have any clarification question and we'll have take your note, we'll have plenty of time for discussions uh, later. So let me get started. I'm very excited to be able to work with a uh, carp uh, ARP. Uh, I was before in Massachusetts and then I feel really I'm really in California when I am working with a local agency. So I'm very happy of this opportunity my group had. And as Jose uh, said, uh, we did a data science framework to measure BMTs by mode and purple with location-based service data. Then the agenda I have for today is uh, basically we did kind of two projects in one because when we submitted the proposal was exactly before COVID-19 and then COVID-19 hit. Then we kept the original question and we extended the project to incorporate that crazy natural experiment that COVID is or COVID was. So basically um, the first goal, and I'm gonna be spending some time on that, is to see how good LBSs are because CDR is a is your phone that communicate with an, an antin antenna and you can last with your same phone number for years. And that is not optional. For building purposes, you, we are being tracked in our antenna uh, resolution. And most of the people have a phone and it doesn't matter if it's a smartphone or not. Then the, the other data set is LBS, Google. Okay, sometimes Fridays maybe, Tuesdays. Oh, excuse me? Is that a clarification question? No, it's an unmute mic. Um, okay. Right. The, the, is, am I getting a question? Right. If you're, okay. if you're, yeah, I don't think so. If you please, please, uh, if you, unless you have a question, if not, just go ahead and mute yourself. Okay. Thank you. The LBS is apps smartphone app users that sometimes you can opt out. Then comparing LBS from, uh, from LBS and CDR, it took us a semester because uh, CDR were used already by the World Bank and uh, the National uh, American, uh, what? the TRB, by the TRB National Academy of Science is used, but LBS was much less trusted. So that was our first type of study. Then we use the changes in BMT through the COVID-19 period and the changes in trip purposes as well. And interestingly, we were seeing where people move from homes, uh, from houses in the COVID-19. So a step two to four, we're already with LBS data after we validated the use uh, of LBS data. The fifth question was the more ambitious one and is, if you have a policy intervention, some transportation related intervention in a zone, can we uh, see the changes in vehicle user rate? That is the last uh, piece of uh, research I'm gonna show you. And that is basically the, uh, the type of questions we have. So in short, is location-based service data able to ca capture human mobility patterns with the same quality that CDRs? Or how can we LBS uh, used to measure changes in human, in human mobility behaviors in California during the COVID-19 period. And this is uh, what I mentioned already. CDR has been validated and studied worldwide, worldwide and LBS is just recently become available. But uh, 
let's focus on the comparison. And the take home message already, so that you will see through these slides, you can use both data sets, but both data sets should not be used raw data. They need to have some pre-processing and extraction of users such that the data behave uh, correctly. So all data are wrong and biased and you need to sample them correctly. So here is just for you to, um, to see visually. In the right-hand side, we have the CDR data. And what we got is from the same area, that one shown in the map, seven months of anonymized individual uh, users from CDR. And you would have a location, time span, every time the person send a text, a voice call, and any data traffic. So every time you use your phone, and the company records that for billing purposes. We have longitude, latitude of the antenna that provided the service and uh, the timestamp. The spatial resolution is the antennas. So antenna ID that are the blue. As you see, uh, as a take home message, the antennas are usually located every 5,000 people. That's why you have many more in the dense areas. And then they follow nicely the census tract, which on average also have 5,000 people. Then the LBS, we have six months, same location, anonymized. We have the entire California, but CDR, we only had a Bay Area. Then we're gonna do the um, comparisons in the Bay Area. And the accuracy is much higher. So LBS have that advantage. It's GPS-like, if you think. It's not a perfect GPS, as you will see, but the, the resolution is much higher. Then what are we going to be comparing against? We're going to be comparing against the accepted truth of commute, commuting, that is the census transportation planning package. Here I'm showing, as an example, the percentage of flow quantiles in the entire state. Uh, and the data that we found available from the CTPP is not too new, is from 2012 to 2016. It's good because it, it is uh, updated uh, in that period from the 12 to the 16, but we didn't find a, a more recent uh, data set. And you can uh, aggregate the flows, either track to track, place to place, county to county, or a, a task to task. We'll use this as a benchmark to compare both of our data set after we treat, it, treat them properly for the purpose of detecting mobility patterns. Then what means treating the, the data properly? As I mentioned, every time you use the phone, they use it whenever they want, every user, we have a, a timestamp location. The first uh, activity you do to the data, the first uh, exercise is, detecting if somebody is moving using your phone and you are moving or you are in a given place. Like me speaking to you right now, I could be using my phone, but I'm not moving. So that is detecting the stays. Then after we have the stays, based on when the person goes to that stay, we do work and home detection. This is not something we can check with the user. That's why we call it an imputation of home and work. And after we do that, as you may be thinking, not all the, the there is not one carrier that has the entire population. And in the case of LBS, there is not everybody that have a, a app a, being tracking themselves. To use this for transportation demand modeling, we need to expand the mobile from users to total populations. And I'm going to be showing you in detail what is the expansion needed in each of the cases. So the state of detection procedure is uh, graphically represented in the right-hand side. It's only one user. It has the raw records in blue. Notice the blue dots are still records from the user. And uh, state detection is needs two parameters. A spatial resolution that is up to us, we use H3 uh, level nine, that is 0 0.1 kilometers. This exabins from uh, Uber to mark the zone where the person stay more than a certain time. So that there are records that are within a distance within a given time. Then 
like for example, me talking from here, I'm gonna be sending a signal and it's very short distance within 0 0.1 kilometers and a, a consecutive time that are close to each other. The, then we have all the road records and some of them is the person is staying in a location and some of them, the person is moving. And that is very useful because we take advantage of both type of records al along this project. Um, the exabin tessellation is for the LBS because in LBS you have longitude, latitude, you don't have any antenna related uh, data. The CDR data called detail records data is in the left hand side and look the beautiful tessellation and we don't know, we know only the centroid of these cells. So in rural areas, we cover much bigger regions with only one longitude and latitude. And again, this is acceptable because it's like you would be doing travel at the resolution of census tracts. That is usually uh, not too different from the traffic assignment zones. And again, H3, Uber tessellation, 0 0.1 square kilometers, CDR, uh, antenna records. And then we define the stays between this uh, unit of analysis in each case. So the resolution is different and we treat them uh, each one accordingly. So we don't lose the resolution of the LBS, we keep it. Now that we the state, uh, uh, detected our states, the next thing is to do the home and work detection. And in a nutshell, that uh, antenna that the person are visiting during several times, frequently between 8 p.m. and 7 a.m., where they go to sleep, except for people that work at night, those are going to be misclassified. But that uh, location that you visit uh, regularly every week is imputed as the home. And uh, after a certain distance threshold, the location that you most visit during the day up uh, more than a 0 0.5 uh, miles is imputed at your, as, uh, your work. This type of imputation created a lot of distrust to the data, but is accepted for everybody working with CDR. So we propose these algorithms and it has been used to put the mobile phone data to the service of demand modelers. Then after we impute, mm -hmm. every user has a, yeah. Every user have a home and a work. We need to check with the population information what is this ratio that we call expansion factor. That is, what is the total population within a CDR according to the census data, and versus the total number of homes identified. In the perfect world, this would be one. There is ten people living in this unit and I have 10 users that I detected. I detected everybody. But if not, is how many users, how many people per user I have. That is expansion factor. Let's look them in a figure. And here we have it, not surprisingly, the LBS, the smartphone people are less. Not only smartphone, a smartphone people using the app that is tracking you. So on average, the expansion factor is 90 for LBS, while for CDR is 34. For this carrier, it's about 30% of the population. We have every 34 people in, an, in a census tract, we have one mobile phone a person represented them. And for the case of LBS, LBS is a, every 90 people, we have one. So it's less data, the LBS. However, we saw we are going to see if how well they are represented in a space. And then uh, let's see if, how are we doing with the numbers. So basically, after we put the threshold of number of visits to home and number of visits to work, we lose a lot of the users. Why? Because in the CDR and the LBS, there are a lot of users that only are seen short periods of time. So we're being conservative 
to do the validation among the two sources. And then we, we ended up having only 10%, that means 176,000 users uh, commuters in CDR and 129,000 commuters in the LBS, 20% of the data sets, because they were more active uh, records than in the CDR. They were a few, many users that were very sparse. And uh, here is the table, uh, users with home, is this number, users with work is a slowdown and users with home and work is these numbers. So now we have this amount of users that are identified with home and work. Let's convert the uh, travels from home to work into flows and compare that with the CTPP. Ah, before we do that, I'm sorry. So let's see where they are, right? First, and before going into the flows, let's see if, for example, my LBS users are only in urban areas, only in rich areas, and here is what we have, the green dots. The green dots, when you have here 10 to the 4 American uh, community survey population versus the population from the CDR. So it have a correlation of uh, 1, while the work uh, our users have a correlation with a CDPP flow of 0.85. Those are the correlations with the CDR. We knew, given the use, broad use of CDR, that that was going to be good. The surprise of our study is, look how beautiful. Even if we have less data, how good correlation we have with the LBS data. So contrary to the common thought that would be LBS is not everywhere. They are LBS user good representation of every census tract in the population. And then of course, when we go from users to total, by definition, this is perfect straight line. And then when we expand them through the workplaces, it is still a very good uh, correlation. So now we know how they are spatially distributed, both in home and work, our users of the two data sets. And this is the flows. Remember, when you are doing OD flows and you have N locations, the chances to get it wrong is N squared. So flows are very hard to make them corre uh, good correlations. And to our great surprise, the LBS data that we have less uh, hope from give us a better correlation. It may be, perhaps, I, I don't really know because I would say that the time, but the time is not even the case. So we have a, the CTPP is old and our LBS and CDR data are relative, from two, uh, 2019 on. So I don't know how to explain why, but our samples of LBS is much better correlated in the flows than the CDR. However, both correlations, given the small units that we are doing the flows, uh, are acceptable in both cases. So just to give you a visual idea, I'm showing only the top 10% of the flows. In the left-hand side, we have CDR. In the left-hand side, we have the top 10% CTPP, Commuting Transportation Planning Packing Flows. And notice the difference. What is the difference to explain this? Is that the CDRs, overestimate, I would say, the number of trips between visiting antennas, as you see here. Then when we compare LBS data with CTP, CTPP flows, is much better. So that is one a weakness we saw into the CDR data set. The good news is that the data that is available, for example, to CARP, to continue research, to us, the data that we can use for purchase, is LBS data. So up until here is very good news that I speak highly of the LBS data. Then let's look at a few other things that is, this uh, um, a slide I would like that you remember because many people sometimes when they are selling you LBS data, they call it GPS. And you may be thinking that it's a perfect trajectory every certain time of the day, you would have records. Here we are comparing the Delta T the delta T is the time between two consecutive records in my set of users, LBS and CDR. Then we have 
a lot of users that are every second when I send many texts at, at the same time, then a few use, uh, other users that are every minute, every hour, and sometimes we spend, let's say, eight hours, we are sleeping, we are not having any records. And for some few cases, notice a, a, a small number here, this is lock lock, we have a users that you have one record today and one record 24 hours later. And sometimes even uh, more, like a, a few days without using any record in your phone. So this power law like behavior of the inter event time between records is called burstiness. And is observed very similar both in CDR and LBS. So a sparse temporal red data is present in the two sources. Then we see the radius of gyration. And very nicely, uh, what we observe is that the CDR radius is a little higher. Why? Because in LBS data, we can capture closer locations. So this from orange to red is the measurement effect. But the distribution of trips is pretty similar, the, the type of distribution. And we have the, the average is around uh, 38 for LBS, 19 for CDR. And here we have another aspect that is very interesting to ask the data. How many locations each of my users visited per day? In the LBS, on average, we see the people on average in four different locations or states locations per day with the CDR only two. One reason for that, it may be that the higher resolution of the LBS al allows me to resolve one location in two parts. For example, I'm here uh, at UC Berkeley and I have two buildings because I have two departments. Maybe in the antenna resolution, I'm seen in, as labeled as in one location, but in the LBS, because it's higher resolution, I'm seen in two polygons. So that is a comparison regarding the number of locations. And this is something very interesting that was discovered a few years ago in the phone data. And that is that in the same data set, we have a group of users that only are seen in five locations, 10, 15, 80, et cetera. And if you do this plot, that is rank of the location, rank is from one, two, three, four, five, if you have five locations, from one to 30, if you have 30 locations, and you calculate here the frequency of visits, it follows this nice zip law that is L to the power of minus one. So you are, you have your first location that have much higher frequency and then as the rank goes high, the probability of finding you there decreases as L to the minus one and L is the rank. That was an interesting finding we did years ago. What is beautiful is can be after you parse the LBS data, it can be found in LBS. So this is a 10 year old finding in CDR is a new finding in, in LBS. So from all angles, I am looking at the data after you parse the locations, it is as good as CDR to do a, for a mobility model detection. This is the distance of travel. And we have a group of users that have RG five kilometers up to group of users that have 80 kilometers and the both data sets follow the same distribution. And finally is the entropy. The entropy is telling me how likely, what is the probability that I'm gonna be found in my own locations and what is the entropy or, or the disorder I have in the set of locations the users visit. What we observe is that the LBS have slightly higher entropy than the CDR. And this is because this reason, we have higher entropy because we have more locations uh, observed. However, overall the behavior of this finding of the entropy is also reproduced with the LBS. Finally, my favorite resort is something I, I myself discovered with the mobile phone data that there are certain patterns that describe most of the trips of the population and they are called network motif. And we are able to calculate the network motif and they were the same 
for both LBS and CDR. So from all the combinatoric ways, you can uh, fill up networks of different sizes. Those are the ones, for example, with three locations, they behave like this. With four locations, there are more graphs that you can form right down with four locations, but those are the ones that are in the data and so on and so forth. So 80% um, of the travel behavior for the LBS and CDR users are represented by 13 motifs. Are there days that are out of this list of motifs? Yes, 20% of the travels, but 80% only 13 motif give us good chances to describe the daily uh, behavior of the people. And this refers to uh, if the users can be classified as explorer versus returners. And what we're doing here is the RG, how the RG is reproduced with the K most visited location. If you are a returner, you don't explore a lot, you only need two locations to reproduce your RG. However, the more uh, you explore, you need a locations or more to reproduce your RG. So based on that, you have a this bimodal uh, type of distribution in which the ones that are here are the explorers and the ones that are here are the returners. So both uh, this finding was uh, discovered this uh, labeling of the population was discovered with CDR and it's impressive how similar it is for the LBS. So in conclusion, with a proper processing step, LBS data can be used to estimate similar mobility metrics than CDR and uh, LBS provides higher spatial resolution than CDR and is much easier and available to obtain. And with that, we Proceed. I would like to, uh, if somebody have a question, I would like to take it, but I can proceed now with our COVID-related analysis and everything was done with the last four, uh, three, four years of data from LBS. So I'm not going to be working more with a, a CDR because CDR, we have it for a given period and it's very hard to find LBS data. We only need to have a a contract with the provider, and in this case, is a spectus, the provider. Then we enter into the COVID area. We have several years of data, 2019, 2020, 2021, and even 2022. For analyzing the data, then we do, again, the extraction of users, the ones that have more records and they are observed in the entire period. So we don't work with users that are observed too short and they have too few records. We work with these uh, active users. And uh, they need to have at least uh, 10 to the power of 2.5 records and being observed at least during 60 days. And then we do the same exercise again, that is a state detection, home imputation, and work imputation. And we are comparing how many uh, users we are identifying and in the census track, and they are nicely uh, correlated. So we have population and users with a given expansion factor that we observed. And with this uh, filter that we can have enough records uh, we have what we call the qual high quality users. So we are eliminating these sparse users. And then we go from 9 million to 3.4 million users for the respective years. Notice one thing that is a headache for our research that in 2019, we have 9.4 million users in the entire Bay Area. However, after 2020, 21, and 22, it, it almost, almost, uh, was caught in that is a limitation of the data then if we want to be able to impute home and work this is the number of users we ended up so always we go from users to active users to ones that can be imputed home and work i recommend to be conservative because if not you introduce noise to the data. So that has been my experience. And then still we have plenty of users in the Bay Area 
that we are able to impute home and work. And that after you impute home and work to this data, you can use it as, as it were a survey. Then let's start bringing a, being into, into business if we can measure VMTs. Let me tell you, it's very hard to impute a car trip. What we do is motorized, non-motorized, and we do a distance of travel and imputing the vehicle usage rate of the of the homes. Those are two ways in which as proxy of BMT. We are not asking them if they are doing a, a vehicle trip. So we impute VUR, vehicle user trade, and we measure very well the distance traveled by the users. So why do we do this? As we know, we would like to have decrease in BMTs as an ambitious uh, goal. Then the emergence of the COVID-19 brought about substantial limitations and changes in people's mobility. So being able to detect these changes with this data was one of our goals. And the specific question is, how do we leverage LBS data to detect mode changes? So the mode detection algorithm, we do a mix of unsupervised learning and a Gaussian mix mixture model to define three clusters based on the length of the trajectory and the speed. And we can confidently say that we have non-motorized vehicles, a movement and motorized vehicle. That's the way we define. And remember, we have a stops and pass by, the blue dots in the map. So in the pass bys, we measure the length of the trajectory and the speed. Pretty uh, simple. And then the distance, we do the radius. So we do all the distance of a given location where the person is minus the location of the home. And we do the square uh, of that. So we add all that. This is weighted by the number of times you are in the given location. And we do that average. So in average, the RG tells us the average distance from home that the person has been uh, traveling. Then higher uh, distances suggest higher VMTs and lower distances you are traveling less. Imputing your vehicle usage rate for the census tract where the uh, user was located. Then we see here different uh, places in California, and it's fantastic to see how we have, how we compare with the RG that we have in January 2029. And then we see how that changed in 2020. And it's incredible how we are all synchronized. We are uh, tracking the users that live in Imperial, in LA County, in Orange County, in Santa Barbara, Fresno, et cetera. And in all these counties, it was, it go all down at the same time, goes up, goes down and goes down again, because here was a, a, another a wave of infection. So we look at this carefully and the only thing we could conclude is that uh, the changes in percentage of, a, of RG were higher with county areas higher. So that means more rural. More rural counties have a little higher uh, let me, uh, change in RG. No, no, excuse me, excuse me. It's the other way around. Rural areas were less uh, prone to stay at home. So we have smaller county areas are urban and then they we was staying everybody at home, like up to 50% less in RG. However, if you are in a rural area, you have also changed energy, but smaller. So, and overall, we have changes in energy from 20% to 50% less than January 2029. Then we can see these changes of travel pattern, both weekend and weekdays, then we're having here the weekly patterns. And we see nicely that people was more prone to be at home on Sundays than weekdays and Saturdays during the pandemic. So we are showing here uh, the whole year 2020. And then we check, try to find something uh, 
based on the income group. So we are uh, changing the average BNT per capita, and we are seeing uh, the different uh, quantiles of income, less than 40,000 income in the track where they live, or more than 100,000. And we see that there is slightly, a slightly uh, more BMT per capita if you have in the higher uh, census tract income. However, notice the big error bars. So what happened here that more than income, what it matters if you are more urban or more rural in this BMT per capita. Then let's talk about three purpose. And then how we define trip purpose. So we define commute as a trip that start at home and it's at work and home. And then we have the commute networks. And then within the commute networks, we extract clusters also called community detection that is based on the modularity. And the modularity is the degrees to which a network can be partitioned in the subsets. And we apply the Louvain method, that is a, uh, is a method to cluster networks. In networks, the, the clusters that are uh, places that have many trips to the inside and to the outside are called communities. Then, first we observe the statewide trends and we see the chart reduction. This is how cool the data tell us. All these peaks down are uh, either weekends or holidays. And then we see also the state uh, white shelter in place. And when we say we are labeling the trips by purpose, we divide non-work trips, it's a big fraction. We have a uh, work trips in red, which clearly cut in the, in the holidays. And we have the ratio of home, uh, of work to non-work trips. So being able to labeled the trips by purpose with LBS was one of the goals. And here we are showing that it, it have a very reasonable behavior. And then when we were looking how this changed into COVID, basically these are not very friendly uh, trips, but what this tells you is a uh, few things. The world locations are less concentrated during COVID-19 across four regions in California. So they are a uh, more spread apart. So people would go to work in more spread apart uh, distance. Uh, nicely, we could see the same levels of 2019 only in 2022, that are the red and the blue plots. 2020 and 2021 were different already. People was still not having the same type of flow. And uh, the transition to remote work affected the areas with much offices, of course. Then let's do this community detection analysis I uh, described before. The nodes are the, the polygons where we have uh, the different uh, travelers. The edges means the number of, tra uh, that there exists a travel between them. And the communities are zones that are connected by commuting travels. Excuse me? <laughs> ah, it's not, it's breaking. I cannot hear the question. The modularity is around 0 0.6. That is acceptable result. And here we have the, uh, how it looks like. And interestingly, what happened in 2020 is that, for example, what we see here in yellow, there are a lot of trips to the region more than to the outside. And then we have here the North California, we have the LA region. So this is partitions of the map that are based on trips. What happened during the COVID-19 is that big communities partition broke down. So we have more communities in 2020. That means we have more cluster. That means the travels were more fragmented. Then the next uh, task we did is during COVID, that was a question that was only meant to be during COVID, is what happened with the people? Did they change location? How many changes? Because again, this is a typical thing that we feel that something is happening. 
but can we quantify it? And then basically we uh, apply a method that was published, uh, but the method that was published uh, was for big regions. And our regions, we wanted to make it at the census tract level somehow. So we spend decent amount of time. How do we detect home changes over short periods of time and short distance? Because the, the method was published by cities and we wanted to see if people would change during a COVID, which is a relatively short period in the state. Then we basically, uh, it's hard because we need to first, it's different from the home imputation because somebody can move to a different location and still come back and visit. Uh, their original uh, town. So the first uh, task we need to do in this activity is to detect the move day. And then uh, calculate the distance between the cloud of records before and after the move day. That is what we need to do. And for that, we do some uh, machine learning methods that allow us to cluster the two clouds, where you were before, where you are after. It was more challenging than what we originally expected. And here is an example of somebody in the, you have longitude, latitude and the event date. And that is a case in which the person moved to the red region, but they were also uh, visiting before moving to the place. But notice what happened in the red after certain time. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't appear uh, anymore in the blue region. Then the way we would validate, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. let me tell you some numbers here. Jose, do you know how to mute the person? Yeah, 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 you might know, can we wait a few more minutes uh, for, for questions? Just letting Marta finish the presentation and we'll get to the question and answer. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you so much. Then we have 23,000 users with no home change and 5,000, uh, we mix. 5,000 synthetic home changes. So basically, because we could, the way to validate the home detection algorithm was to create synthetic moves, mix them with places that has not, with users that have not moving home. And we wanted to validate how could this be uh, done. And here is that we have a estimated move day actual move day and notice that they are uh, in blue correct and in red are certain moments in which we could not detect. So again, what we learned from this is that uh, changes of home detection is a difficult uh, algorithm. The overall accuracy that we got is 86%. And here are examples of label of move day and this is the type of things that is hard. So it was first living in the red zone, then in the blue zone and so on and so forth. And that is the, and this is the why it makes hard. For example, this user in the right is the typical user. It moved to this region, but it visits a few days the other region. That is why it's a hard problem. However, we got 86% accuracy with this uh, algorithm. And then now that we have the, the, algorithm validated, we want to see the number of relocations between COVID-19. So, and what we discovered in this data is that um, the greatest number of relocations occur at the very beginning of the stay in place order. And they were most likely than in the other years. The reason of this shape that goes up and down is because we need a threshold of number of days. Then it decreases the ability to detect the number of states at the beginning and at the end of your data because we have this uh, need 
to statistically measure the moving day. So the shape of the curve is due to sampling reasons. However, clearly we have this jump that happened only during 2020 after the stay in place order. So here are uh, the 20 percentile uh, below uh, income level and the 80 percentile above the income level. And what we see is that we don't see um, a strong correlation between income and the changing of home. And then, uh, perfect, uh, we are, I'm, I'm about to finish uh, the hour uh, speaking, then we have 30 minutes for questions, but then I can tell you a little bit about the most ambitious question that this project has, and it's very useful, it's bringing the phone data to the limit, that is how mobility policies in, can uh, affect the change in vehicle user trade. That is the question we wanted to address. And this is the first time I seen uh, that is being done in the US for, for uh, mobile phone data for this question. Then basically, let me the, tell you the, the GMM based mode detection, then we use the Gaussian mixture model to detect the motorized, non-motorized trips. So we apply this again for the policy uh, related scenarios. We define VUR as a percentage of all trips that are motorized. We do bootstrapping to create distribution of VUR, of VUR and the mobility policies were not chosen by us, they were given to us uh, in the Sacramento area and they were selected by the Professor Susan, Susan Handy's uh, team. And then which are these changes in mobility? In February, 2019, uh, it was a release of electric scoot scooters. In March, 2019, it was uh, the release of GIG cars in the area. In June 2019, we have other uh, fleet of electric And finally, in September 2019, we have a Sacramento rapid transit uh, launch, a new uh, rapid transit uh, data set. He, and what is beautiful is that we're using LBS for the... Um, the area that we have for the year that we have more trips, everything only stood in these few census tracts in Sacramento. So the four interventions I mentioned were happening in this region. And here we show the number of users. Of course, the number of users decreased because we are only focusing in the users that travel in these census tract regions. And here are the results. So basically, uh, every time we observe, for example, the release in e-scooters decrease VUR, we can see that in A and C, we have the February and June, you have less VUR when you decrease the e-scooter. The release of GIG car is honestly not uh, especially uh, significant, uh, statistically significant, but we have a slightly increase in the VUR after the GIG cards is in part B. In uh, D, we have this one here, is the rapid transit. Again, not statistically significant. So the ones that we uh, saw clearly is in this C, that we see a strong decrease in, mo in vehicle user trade motorized trip in our data set with the new scooters. So we cannot properly assure that that was the reason, but we saw the 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 changes, and it's promising to have been able to see some changes uh, post this release in this very concentrated area. So in conclusion, we observed a significant decline in BMT during COVID nineteen lockdown with regional disparities. BMT in urban. Uh, uh, counties decrease up to 55% and in rural counties between 20 and 
commute trips recovered at a slower pace compared to not commute trips in 2020. And uh, that meant the lasting change in remote work. We developed a novel home and change detection algorithm and found that increase in both the numbers uh, and the distance of relocation the first two weeks in March 2020. And we developed an unsupervised mode detection model and found that the jumps increase in fleet size in June 2019 decrease the overall VUR. So the one that we're using is just that super significant change that we observed. We would like to do more studies to, uh, that try to measure non-motorized changes with policy interventions. And that's it that I have for you. And I would be delighted to has time to discuss with you any question, comment, future uh, vision for future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If there are questions, feel free to raise your hand so I can keep track of who wants to ask a question. Or you can you can also type in questions or comments in the chat. Uh, and Martha, there are two questions. Uh, Marvin, yeah, Marvin, I'll get to you. I'll just get to the questions in the chat first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get to you. So there, yeah, there are two questions in the chat, Marta, related about the challenges of using cell phone data. Um, so I, I, I can read the first one. Uh, so this is from Chad. Uh, Chad says he has uh, read a few papers that have documented the challenges with using cell phone data to determine trip mode, in particular, differentiating transit versus car versus bicycle in any city environment. And uh, Chad is asking, what is your perspective on the practical usability of cell phone data to make these kinds of determinations? Yes. Uh, the, with everybody that even has founded companies, and they do live in out of uh, doing mobility analysis for phone data, uh, mode detection it was something that I was very skeptical and very worried about. And then the Short question is, you need to be very conservative, very conservative to attribute home work, and in this case, motorized, non-motorized. So in this research, I learned that with LBS data, yes, you can label motorized, non-motorized, and you lose a lot of users in the, in the way because it have to be long travel, high speed. That is for sure. It's no way it was non-motorized. And that's a way we uh, uh, we capture that. And then the other stream is home and work, the label locations that we have, home, work, and other, that occur so slow, and they are relatively short, that is motorized. So it can be done with LBS data. We did not do it with CDR because CDR is a jump from one antenna to another antenna. It may be very, very long trips that could be uh, well, affected with CDR. Well. Yes, and then should I, uh, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm very interested. Yeah. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, yes, the, the other question, Martha, do you want me to read it or? No, I can't read it. So okay, great. you Thank discussed you. the challenges with using cell phone. Okay, to create trip tours for use in activity-based models over the traditional forested model, home-based work, et cetera, and return trips. Post-COVID-19, it would be seen like trip tours would, would have changed significantly than they were before their home and world locations being the same. The first validations and studies uh, with mobile phone data, it was homeward other four time step. The motive, nicely, we measure these tours with the, with the LBS data, CDR data and survey data. We did not pay attention, thank you for that question, to see how the motive would change uh, post COVID. Definitely during COVID, we would be seeing changes. But yes, based on my experience with the data, if you detect uh, well, yeah, yeah, if, yeah, 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 thanks to the fact I, that I, 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 that people repeat the location, so you can level these preferred locations based on my uh, frequency plot. You can measure trips, uh, tours, and those are measured through the individual daily 
motive. Great, right, thank you. Again, if you have a comment or want to have a question, please raise your hand or type it in the chat. Uh, Marvin, you're up. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was um, insightful. One thing I was asking or wondering to myself during how does this, um, because of how it defines slave, how does it determine, you know, people, especially I know here in the inland region of California, Southern California, we have a lot of people who work night shifts, for example, because that's when warehouses want people to work at night. So how does it it deal with people who work those other alternate types of schedules, especially if you know it's gonna make it look like they live at the warehouse if it if it counts that time? Absolutely, absolutely. So for traffic purposes, <laughs> we are mislabeling them, but at least we know that that place we you can also see expand the definition of home and work as your day most visited location night most visited location because we didn't use other aspect of the work so it's where the person is going to be found at day and at night and it, it, it was a flow between these two locations but you are absolutely right that was part of our concern too However, they are still a small fraction, very small fraction of the population. But yeah, that is a bad thing of working with this data. It's passively collected. You can never ask the person. And then I think I have... I have another question regarding the K and the this explorer of return. Oh. So basically, depending on the K, so you explore. It's not that I select four versus. Uh, so let me repeat the question. The question is, how did you decide use K two or K four for returner or explorer from slide twenty seven? So basically. K2 is some group of users. So in the case of K2, you need two locations to describe your RG. Those are first group of returners. Then K4, then you lose the a certain group of returners. So that means you need four locations to recover your, your, your RG, so on and so forth. So we have degrees of returner of an explorer. So we just experiment with all the case, and they are the most returners are in this group. And after you have A locations, you almost do not have anybody in this group, except with the LBS data, because as we know, LBS data has more visited locations. But then again, it's not a choice, uh, it's just a, a Exploration. So at every stage, you change your labels. And you like you, yeah, yeah, yeah. more returners yeah, are with K equal to. Emmanuel, sorry, we have a hard time hearing you. I don't know if you can uh, type your comment or question in the chat. Uh, are there any other comments, questions, mother folks? Marvin, is that a hand from before? Or you still have a question? Oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to lower it. No worries. Sorry, Manuel. I have a. I, I'm really. I really apologize. I'm really sorry. Uh, would you like to chat? I would. I'm curious. I would love to uh, hear your question. Is it okay you write it in the chat? 
Yeah, I really apologize. Yeah, I encourage you. I'm that so in the sorry. Chat. If not, <laughs> you can you know, chat, If you want to uh, write it in the chat or send me an email, I would be totally happy to engage in. Yes, definitely. My email is in the chat. Would you feel free to send me an email? Thank you, Manuel. Any other questions, comments? I do have a question, Martha, about the, of course, there's, there's, there's some challenges with using big data, but as, as you know, you find out the different opportunities with LBS as well, like what are some of the things that we can, you know, that we will see maybe changing that can help, you know, kind of sort of like big data, cell phone data become, you know, a better source of information for us to really oh, yeah, 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 have yeah, a better yeah. accuracy uh, of how yeah, people yeah, are yeah, traveling yeah. or moving around. I think uh, by doing this exercise, publishing these results, what we can do is that it is possible to trust the models when you have total demand models, like the one that Replica is sharing, is, is LBS, I would give green lights. Then as I see is that we as a community can spend much less time calibrating these models or buying these models and start already thinking in the applications. One dream application I would like to have is given the flow Realistic uh, flow uh, 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 in a uh, region, uh, Berkeley downtown. Uh, uh, what happens if you reduce parking? What happens if you uh, reduce the use of streets? How is going to affect traffic? So already uh, 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 of the travelers, we can uh, go ahead to the, the the things we need. If uh, you put more buses, where I would put more buses. So going with the planning interventions and see the difference because now we don't have so much time spending in the calibration of the models. You have millions of flows. Now let's do, okay, given this demand, how we alter the opportunities for travels to go to serve less BMTs, for example. That's my vision these days. I have also shared my email with Michael in the chat. You know, again, feel free to reach out to us with an email or happy to engage with you, as Martha mentioned. Happy to you. Are there any, any questions, comments from other folks? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So there's nothing else, Martha. I just you know, wanna take this opportunity to thank you and everybody for joining. You know, thank you, Martha, as well for all your your research team and and helping develop this you know really important project. Uh, also want to remind folks that I posted the links to the contract web page where you will be able to find. The recording to this presentation, the slides for the presentation and the final report. Uh, so those are available in the chat here. And as always, our content information for myself and Martha is also in the chat. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, again, Martha, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure working with you. you got and I hope to thank continue you. working with you in the future. Thanks a lot for coming to this presentation. It was Thank you. a fun work to do.